Well, good morning. My name is Sean Bagley. I serve the youth here at Alpine, and it's great to be here. We meet on Sunday, 6 to 7.30, and it's been a pleasure my first nine months here. It's uh, really, really great being here. I, I didn't know that this is the campus. This is a service for the, for the Las Vegas Raiders, so Raider Nation, welcome. We, we uh, yeah, yeah, I knew I, that would get an applause. I, I'm wondering if I need to become a fan or... I've been a San Francisco 49er fan, but I'm tired of being depressed. I'm tired of having to watch the History Channel to watch when they used to be good and win meaningful games. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm like, well, they are kind of from the Bay Area. And anyways, uh, but uh, any you guys enjoy Easter? Any guys enjoy Easter, right? Really good. You are, you are uh, uh, invited to have enjoyed that service and to really enjoy that God loved you so much that he would stop at nothing to rescue us from our brokenness and our our hopelessness and our, 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 our missing the mark, that He gave His Son to die in our place. And then He rose again on the third day, just as He said He would. And he, he, he then spoke to people and then ascended to sit at the right hand of God. And you're allowed as a Christian, as a Christ follower, to enjoy that news. All right? You're in, you're, you're, I just want to give you permission that a major part of the Christian life is about joy not joy in about what we've done, but joy, it, totally enjoying what God has done. What God has done in, 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 in our place. So we're, that's pretty outrageous that God would do that. And we're going to follow up uh, the Easter with another sermon series about the outrageousness of God. I, uh, there is a show that has gained an immense amount of popularity these past years called Fixer Upper. It's on HGTV. Don't judge me because I watch it. Any guys watch that show? Any ladies, right? Yeah, all the ladies. I see that. No, a few guys. I'm just kidding. I, uh, I don't recommend you men letting your wives watch this. Don't pick up this bad habit for a few reasons. It stars this couple, Chip and Joanna Gaines, and uh, they go through and they buy these homes that are almost going to be destroyed by the city because they're so deranged and and, and messed up, and they go and they, they find a buyer, and the buyer buys a, a, a house, and they go in there, they do all these remodeling things, they knock out walls, and, and as a couple, Chip and Joanna, they always get along. I'm all, who is this guy? Like, he never argues with his wife. I'm all, this, this show needs to go off the air. He's giving me a bad name. And not only is he always nice to his wife, like, he can do anything, the guy can do anything in the house. Like Joanna's like, I want that wall there, and I want tile here, and I want this here, and I want that. I want that chimney that's from 1975 that needs to be destroyed. I want you to, to do some stucco on it and make it look modernized. And I want, I want lamps here, and I want, I want recessed lighting here. And, I, and he's all, sure, honey, anything else I can do for you? Want me to grab you a drink? I'm like, who is this guy? This show needs to stop. This is outrageous. And then, and then on top of that, when, when the buyers come back and they see that this, this house is totally retrofitted from the outside to the inside, the, the, everything is sparkling. Joanna comes after Superboy Chip comes and does all his rock star stuff. She comes in with a professional eye of interior decorating, and she just totally beautifies it. And the, the couples, when they come back to see the house that they bought, and now it's totally redone, a lot of them, they're overjoyed with like, wow, that's amazing. That's outrageous that you can do it. And I'm like, that's outrageous too. It is outrageous. That chipper, old good old chipper, that he's that, you know, that he's that amazing. I mean, I mean, these guys do such a good job. This show takes place in Waco, Texas. They make Waco, Texas seem like a potentially desirable place to move to. It's outrageous. <laughs> Now, if you're from Waco, I'm sorry, but I'm just being honest. Like, it just doesn't seem like, hey, honey, I just want to move to Waco. But now with these guys, with the games, they, they're making it look really cool. And so it's outrageous, though, that they, they can come and, and just really transform a home that was formerly, uh, you know, almost, you know, uh, put a crime scene tape around it and, and abandoned. So now it's like they're the, they're, everyone's wanting to move in with them. They got in-laws calling them up. Hey, I want to get a selfie in front of your house. I mean, it's just, it's just outrageous what can happen. But I want to tell you guys that the God of the Bible does outrageous things for people who trust Him. He comes and does something far more uh, marvelous and beautiful than, than anything that a, that, a, that a construction worker can do or Chip and Joanna can do inside the heart and the soul of people who will trust Him and and. and, and believe what he's done in their place. 
That's how, and so we're, we're looking at that, how he heals the blind, he, he helps the lame to dance, he loves the unlovable, and, and one of the things we're going to look at today is that how God is so good to us, he's so wonderful, he's so outrageous, he helps us forgive. I, I don't know if I've met many people that are natural forgivers. There's some who are a little better at it than others, but there's some of us who really struggle. And in my 17 years of, of being in the ministry, <coughs> I've seen this, this issue of forgiveness trip a lot of people up and bondage them and, and really mess their lives up. And so we want to talk about, in starting off this series, about how God is, God's great power, God's goodness will come and He will help us forgive. There is a soldier who said one day, he said, I think God forgives, but God is more forgiving to us than we are of ourselves. More than 83% have reported to, that they would need God's help in order to forgive someone, even themselves. That, that's from a, an article or a book, Reflections on Forgiveness and Spiritual Growth. One of the things that can really trap you guys, that can trap me, is lack of forgiveness for yourself and for other people. And on the flip side of that, conversely, one of the things that can really help us grow, really help us just really grow exponentially in our lives with God and, and in maturity is, is forgiving. It really is. It really, it really allows us to be free and to love others um, um, better. So here's some reasons why we can uh, really struggle with forgiveness of ourselves is we, we make mistakes that we should not have made in the first place. We, we struggle with that. I, I, in being in Utah for 17 years, I've bumped shoulders and talked to a lot of people who really struggle with the mistakes they've made when there was so much pressure to be a certain way, to talk a certain way, to act a certain way. And when word got out about some of their mistakes, they felt shame, they felt guilty, and they really struggle to, uh, to imagine God being good enough to really forgive them. They... they they, they do that. They also, mistakes that were made in the past, that, that we, they can really linger. Sometimes we can see the mistakes that we've made, we still see the people that it's hurt, and we know it. Our people who've hurt us in the past, we, we still feel the hurt sometimes. It might be less than it was before, and sometimes it can kind of grow. It's kind of weird how, how we're shaped and, and, uh, as, as humans, but, but this is a really, really tough issue. And another Another thing is mistakes that they made over missed opportunities. Why did I not buy Amazon stock? What was I thinking? Why did we listen to all those prognosticators? I could have been retired by now, right? If I would have bought 10,000 shares. But I listened to those people. Or I should have took that promotion. Why did I keep that job? Why did I say that thing to my boss? Why didn't I say that thing to my boss? I had a perfect opportunity, right? Why didn't I do this? Or... or and parenting, as our kids grow up and sometimes they, they struggle, it's easy to press rewind on as parents, isn't it? And, and say, why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? And you see, this can be like a recording, like a broken record that keeps on going back again and again and again. And today we're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul before he came to know Jesus and after he came to know Jesus. And we're going to look at a man who was one of the the, the worst individuals you, you'll ever meet in the Bible who was transformed into one of the greatest people in the history of, of, of humanity. If you look at, at the spread of Christianity in the early church and you see the, the pivotal role that, that the Apostle Paul, uh, you, there's no ignoring the, the immense change that came through him. But he was born a good, a good Jewish young boy. He went through all of the checklists that the religious people had of that day. Every single checklist he had, he, he got a full ride scholarship to the best school. He, had a, he, he studied under the tutelage of Gamaliel, who was one of the best teachers of, the, of, the, of that day. If you, if you guys know any people, anybody who knows the Bible really well, Paul, even before he knew Jesus, would, would run circles around most people. That guy knew the, the, the first five books, the, the, the law. He knew the, the, the historical books. He knew the Psalms. He knew, all, he, he just was, was, was a whiz. He, he was very, and he was enabled to be into the, the pharisaical sect, which was a, a group of priests who had a huge amount of self-discipline. They were, you think about the, the most religious person you know, the pa most passionate person, and they would probably pale in comparison 
with, um, with the Apostle Paul when he was named Saul. He, and I want to we take a look at his life. Look at what he was before he came to meet God. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers, so he went to the high priest. <clears throat> I want you to think about words. Words, if you want to get to know someone, you want to get to know what's inside the heart, Jesus says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you want to get to know somebody, you just sit down and listen to them for a while and see what, what their response is to life. And Saul here was, th this is Paul before he met Jesus, he, he was named Saul. But he was uttering threats with every breath, really exposing, the, the, the author here is trying to show this guy was really passionate and really consumed with killing people who were following Jesus. Like when he says, uttering threats with every breath. Every, like, second, he was, like, you talk about OCD, right? This guy was just perpetually thinking about how can I destroy this movement that this Jesus guy has started. So he's, so he's uttering threats. He's, he's thinking about how can I stop it? How can, I, how can we get this? So he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for the cooperation, the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So he goes on to say, so he, uh, he was really passionate. The, the, the word, the way, let's go back to see if I could do this the right way, um, of the way was, was a term used to, oh wait, that's another one, I'm sorry, that's the next one, never mind. I, I'm, yeah, never mind. The, the, the way, look, look, oh wait, now I'm confused. What did I do? What did I do? I'm getting a little jumpy here, a little jumpy. There we go. He goes on, I went after anyone connected with this way, went at them, hammer and tongs, ready to kill for God. I rounded up men and women right and left and had them thrown in prison. You can ask the chief priest or anyone in the high council to verify this. They all knew me well. <coughs> So Paul is just letting us know that he went into the early church. Picture yourself as a follower of Jesus. You're having a meal with your, with your family or you're at work, and this guy comes and arrests you and takes you away from your family, takes you away from your kids, and either has you killed or has you incarcerated and imprisoned. Think about the families that were left behind, the kids who didn't, no longer had a dad that, that, could, that could provide for them. And, and nowadays... Um, it is much easier in our economy, in our society, for women to get jobs. But back in those days, it was extremely hard that Paul was that passionate about destroying the church. And he's, he goes on to say, and if you think I'm, I'm lying or over-exaggerating, you can talk to the chief priest today. You could talk to the high council. That was a bunch of people who were of the pharisaical sect. You could talk to those guys. They knew me really well. They knew what I was before that. And... Um, and they knew that I was passionate about doing this. And he goes, then I went off to our brothers in Damascus, armed with official documents, authorizing me to hunt down the followers of Jesus there, arrest them, and bring them back to Jerusalem for sentencing. He hunted down Christians like wild animals. He treated them less than, human, than, than humans should be. He persecuted them, imprisoned them. He, he was exceedingly just mad and furious because that's what can happen when we are trying to make our, uh, when we're trying to make right, a right relationship with God in our own, um, uh, our own works, which what Paul was trying, Saul was trying to do before he became Paul. This is what happens: that he was blinded. But these are his skeletons. Paul's not bragging about this to be like, "Hey, check me out." These are embarrassing things. These are skeletons that that he's just saying, "Here, here, here's me. Here's what I was." I would ask you what past skeletons are in your closet that you don't want anyone to know about? What regrets or sins are you carrying around that you can't seem to forgive yourself of? I think one of the most difficult things we can do is carry around the heavy weight of lack of forgiveness of others and lack of forgiveness of ourselves. There's a movie called The Mission. It stars uh, Robert De Niro. He plays the character of Rodrigo Mendoza. He was a slave trader, mercenary, and a man who killed his own brother. The regrets of his past transgressions were like a heavy weight that was destroying his life. He says in the movie that there is no redemption for me. 
So he tries to, to do penance for his sins. Now, some of you might, might wonder, what is penance? What he's, what, he's trying, what he's trying to do is he was trying to work off his bad works. So the movie shows him climbing a mountain with things chained to his back. He, he became a part of a movement that was really a, a mission that was helping kids, helping a, a tribe. He was doing anything to help cl- purify his conscience that continued to damn him. He was, he was just trying to say, okay, if I do this, maybe then, I'll, maybe then this, this broken record of all the stuff I've done will go away. And many of us can, can find ourselves in there. And today, the good news, guys, is God can heal us from that misery. That he, and I wanna, we want to look at three steps. Three steps of how to forgive yourself. <clears throat> First one, be honest about your sin. Sometimes we can believe that we can hide stuff from God, but the God of the Bible, it's really interesting. Have you ever um, thought to yourself or asked someone um, or said about someone, that person's a know-it-all? Have you ever done that? Or is that like 20 years ago and now it's not done anything? Like, that person's such a know-it-all, right? Well, when it comes to God, um, he really is a know-it-all. The, 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 the big term that pastors use to sound educated is, that he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. So when we think that we can hide something from God, it's like, um, that's really not a good idea because he already knows. <laughs> and not only does he know the actions that we did, he knows the hidden motives of why we did the actions that we did. He, he sees it for, for all, all, of our, all, all that it is. And we've all said things that we wish we could take back. We've all thought things that we don't want anyone else to know about. And God knows about all those things. <clears throat> in fact, 62% of American adults say they need more forgiveness in their personal lives, according to a survey by a nonprofit Fester Institute. So Paul was honest with his sins. And, and, and we see here in Acts chapter 9, he set off. He's going to do his work. He set off when he went, when he got to the outskirts of Damascus. He was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. As he fell to the ground, he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? He said, who are you, Master? I am Jesus, the one you are hunting down. You see, Jesus confronts him, and he exposes Saul for, who he, for what he was doing, which was totally wrong. It was horrible. And he says, you're doing this actually to me. Um, and that, which is why the, the way that we love God is we love others. And if we don't love others, then the Bible says we don't love God. The litmus test for us, how we're doing with God, is how are we treating people? How are we forgiving people? And, and here we see that Jesus is aligning himself with the church. He was going after people of, of the church, which is the body of Christ. When you come to know Jesus, you become a part of the body of Christ. You become a part of Jesus. And Jesus, becomes a part, Jesus comes into our lives through God the Holy Spirit. And so, Jesus confronts Paul, and Paul had to face the music. See, our God is a God of light throughout the Old Testament, a God of fire, a God, uh, and it's, it's later talked about in all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, how He is a God of truth, and how we cannot, we cannot progress in a walk with God without truth. We have to face truth, and Paul faced the truth. Jesus kind of held up a mirror to him. Hey, Paul, I want you to look at yourself. You're wrong. You're going the wrong way really, really fast. So the first thing, guys, is you can't, if we're hiding things or we're, we're not owning up to things to God and to other trustworthy people, sometimes we just need to confess to other people who love Jesus, a mentor, a pastor, a counselor, and just not hide it anymore. You have to be honest. The second thing, guys, is appreciate the price that Jesus paid. This is found in Hebrews chapter 10. Before I get into this verse, Hebrews was written to Christians who came to know Jesus in the early church, and they were, they were Hebrews. They were Jewish people. They were facing a, an immense amount of persecution. They were losing their jobs. They were being ostracized from their family members and from their, their really good friends, and they were really paying a, a, a tough price. And the, the author of Hebrews, God inspired them to write this to let them know how great Jesus is, and and he he opens up saying Jesus is superior to angels, Jesus is superior to Moses, Jesus is superior to any festival, and here he's saying that Jesus is superior to any priest, to any offering. He says this, 
Every priest goes to work at the altar each day, offers the same old sacrifices year in, year out, and never makes a dent in the sin problem. As a priest, Christ made a single sacrifice for sin, and that was it. Now, that is a big statement right there. You guys realize that? He's saying that Jesus is so great and awesome and amazing and outrageous that when he died on the cross, it was one sacrifice for one sin, and that's it. That's all that's needed. No good works. No going to church on a regular uh, a thing. No, no going on a missions trip. No doing this or doing that. that it, it, it was finished. One act. One sacrifice. That's how great Jesus is. How wonderful it is if we believe that. <laughs> then he sat down right beside God and waited for his enemies to cave in. It was per- a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. Now that's not easy to say. I'm just going to say that right now. Try to say that's a lot of peas, right? Right, where's the word pickle? Um, he got us out of a pickle. Anyways, <clears throat> you guys see the, a theme though, that God sat down. When the, when, when, with Jesus sitting down, what that's saying, when a priest would sit down, usually a priest would not sit down. When the priest is in the temple, he was on his feet working and doing things. But for Jesus to be, to be shown as, later on it shows how Jesus is our great high priest. He stands before God on, on behalf of us. But for Jesus to sit down, he's saying that the, the job has been accomplished, that the mission has been accomplished, the job has been done, the debt has been paid, and you and I don't need to worry about if we've trusted Jesus and are following him, we don't need to worry about, was it enough? Have I done enough? It's done. It's finished. He's sitting down, and, and it says when he ascended to the, he ascended to the right hand of God and, and sat down at the right hand of God, is essentially saying that Jesus has he's done it. The work has been done. That we can now be in a right relationship with God when we trust Him. So, there, so for some of us who are thinking there's no way God can forgive me. I remember one time I thought that. I blew it. I knew, and I knew better. Doesn't that make it even worse? I guess one thing to mess up when you didn't know it, you know? But it's one thing to mess up when you know better, Right? And I was really struggling and put God off at, the, at, a, at an arm's distance. And I remember a mature Christian said, Sean, do you realize that you're probably accidentally insulting Jesus by saying that? And I mean, well, what do you mean? When you're saying you're, you're trying to work off or you you're feel distance from God because you're like in timeout or like a, a, a man-made purgatory, you're, you're, you're insulting Jesus and saying it wasn't enough like well i really don't want to insult jesus (laughs) and guys that's what we do when we say i can't be forgiven when or when we when we say i've got to add my good works onto this we insult the good work that god has done and and this is uh this is what tim keller has said one of my favorite authors he says the christian gospel is that i am so flawed that jesus had to die for me yet i am so loved and valued that jesus was glad to die for me I love that sentence. That's such a mouthful of beautiful truth that all of us would be wise to embrace. Listen again. The Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. And he goes on to say, this leads to deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both swaggering and sniveling. It cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I do not think more of myself nor less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. So we're, we're encouraged to really trust Jesus here, that he really did what he said he did. He accomplished the work that you and I could never accomplish by dying on the cross for our sin. By that single offering, he did, everlast, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. Again, he's reiterating this thing of it's been finished. You can trust what Jesus did on the cross for you. You can grant yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus did on your behalf. You can say, I'm forgiven. And when that voice comes back in your head, are you reminded of the failure? You could just say, you need to talk to Jesus because he's my defense attorney. And he's really good. And he died in my place. And then you need to talk to the judge, who's God the Father, because God the judge has already slammed the gavel and said, it's 
has already acquitted me and said I'm not guilty on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for me. So Satan, if Satan's coming after you with that, which he, he, he will, just say, you need to go talk to Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And if they let you come back to me, then, then, then which they're not, you go take it up with them because I'm trusting his word. Here is a, a and, and the next thing, guys, is not to look back, how to forgive yourself. So be honest about your sin, appreciate the price Jesus paid, and don't look back. Paul says this, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. When we don't let go of the past, here's what we do. Let's picture the past is here, the present is here, and the linear thought, and the future is here. When we don't allow ourselves by the power of the Spirit of God to forgive ourselves and forgive other people, what we do is we drag the past into our present and into our future. And when you and I do that, we destroy our present and our future. And God loves us so much, He doesn't want that for us. And, he's saying, and so Paul's saying, hey, I've really blown it. <laughs> if you feel like you've blown it, check out my resume. I really blew it. And what God has done for me and me trusting him, and when I met him on the way to Damascus, when I was looking to kill other people who are part of his church, what he did is he's helped me forget the past and to look forward to what lies ahead. Because not only did Paul go on to be, to be cleansed and be purified, he was totally transformed. That guy went from a violent per person to a peaceful person. He became, to, to instead of destroying God's church, he built God's church up. And I want to conclude with this wonderful, wonderful verse where Paul's talking about himself. This is a trustworthy saying. So he's saying, hey, any of you guys need stuff to put on your refrigerator or a bumper sticker or something to memorize or think about it, okay, or put, you know, on, on your computer screen or, or really meditate on this? Here's something you ought to, here's something you, you can trust. Here's something you should think about. And everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Now, you might be saying, Paul's such a preacher here. You preachers, you're so into over-exaggerating so that you look better or you sound marvelous or magnificent. Paul's not exagger exaggerating here. He's saying, I'm the worst of them all. And going on to say this, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners then others will realize that they too can believe in Him and receive eternal life. You guys get that? He's saying that there were going to be people like us who might wonder, is there room for me in the household of God? Could God ever forgive me? And he's saying, I was a murderer. I was a blasphemer. I had a terrible anger problem. I blew it. If any of you think you blew it, Check me out. I'm the worst of all sinners. And he's saying that God did that so that all of us could look to him and be like, man, there's room for Paul. There's room for me. If, he, if, if Paul could be forgiven, then what, what, what would keep me from being forgiven? That you can be forgiven by the God of the Bible. Other gods that are out there that, don't, that are not entirely from the Bible, they're going to say, you better work it off. You better be good. You better hope it's enough when it's all said and done. And the God of the Bible comes and says, that's, that's rubbish. That's garbage. That I gave my Son, God, God the Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, to die in your place. I've purchased everything. I've, I, I've paid the debt. You just need to trust me here. And I'll wipe you clean. I'll give you a new, uh, 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 I'll, I'll make you a new creation. And all things will be new. You can forgive yourself. You can forgive other people. You can have a newness of life. You can keep the past in the past and not let it destroy your present and your future. That's good news. That's the truth of this great outrageous God of the Bible. There is room for you at the cross. It is all equal footing at the cross for everyone. 